I was rummaging through the drawer there and I found this old jersey and I just wonder what crosses to mind when you see those particular colours in that jersey? Uh, it, it, great memories. Where I'm old enough to have worn that jersey. Uh, it's, it's, very, it's a very special jersey to me because the, I, I, I wore that coloured jersey, the exact same jersey for my club, the Stephenites. So I never knew what it was like to wear a blue jersey or a, 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 a brown jersey or a, blue, a pink jersey. I always wore uh, the, the Mio colours, the Stephenites colours. And I, actually, the Mio got their colours from the Stephenites. So I'd be very proud of those, of those colours. And I always felt very, very comfortable um, wearing those colours. I, I went to Boston. I, I can't remember what year it was. And I played for me over there as well. So there's always, there's always a, 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 some sort of a magnet pulling me towards those, those colours. And a great, again, you know, for the most part, a lot of fun, great memories. Played with great players, played with great people, um, played in six All Ireland finals, uh, four senior, one under 21, and one club, and were competitive in them all and didn't win them. But was fortunate enough to win seven Connick medals. I, I won four, three or four under 21s. So, you know, overall, it, it's been good. We, uh, you know, since 1951, we've been struggling to get the job done on the, on, on, on the final day. But, uh, you know, they, yeah, they're big regrets, but overall, you'd have to say we had, we had a great time. And are there any particular games that you're transported to when you see when you see that jersey? Well, the the, the big one for me was '89. Uh, uh, Cork one. Yeah, when we that that season, when we um, my father was dying that summer of cancer, and uh, it was it was as you can imagine, it was a tough enough time, and he uh, he he was very sick. The day of the, we, we drew with Galway and beat them in, in the semi finals, and then we drew with um, Roscommon, Derek Duggan. I'll never forget it because of what was going on in, in my personal life at the time. Derek Duggan kicked the ball over the bar to equalise the game. I think it must have been about 63, 64 metres long. And I, I was like on, on the goalpost looking at this going, and I said, oh my God. So that evening I got home, I got home pretty quickly. My father died that evening. He was buried on the Wednesday, and I was back at training Tuesday. The replay was on the following Sunday, and we 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 won it in uh, in uh, in uh, extra time. So, like when I think about me all and all the great days that we had, and all, you know, we had a, a, we had six very tough days, uh, and all the great days that I had, I always think of '89, and you know, I was so happy to win that kind of final replay. If we lost that after burying my dad on the Wednesday, I would have been I would have been devastated, and then we. Had that big win over, we kind of jumped on a quest of wave. All the guys were at the funeral. There was a massive crowd at the funeral. All the boys were there with the Mio gear on them. I think that galvanised us a little bit and certainly made me feel very, very, very much at peace and very, very happy to see them. And uh, we really trained and took off after we won that kind of title. And we beat a very good Tyrone team in the semi finals. And we did the final, thinking we had a great chance of winning that game. But of course, um, I think we were foolish enough to get into a shootout with Cork. And uh, they were slightly better than us on the day. And, you know, people say one of the best games seen in Cork Park. But I suppose when you lose, you get very little consolation from that. You, you mentioned your dad being uh, terminally ill at that time. How much could you focus on football while that was happening? It must have been very difficult or was it a release? Um, I, I, I would say it was a release. Uh, I, I, knew, I knew everybody, my sisters and my brothers and my mother wanted me to play, so... And they wanted me to continue to practice, but I certainly wouldn't have been able to stay in the house, you know, every night of the week. I, I, I was, you know, I was obviously we were in and out of, the, out of the house at the time, but I was very glad to be able to go to train on Tuesday and Thursday night. So I was very glad to get out for an hour and go for a run or shoot some jump, so if you go to the basketball court and shoot around with the boys for a while. So that I think that's very, very important because, like, you, you were like when when somebody belonged to you is sick for three or four months and. It can get very, very hard and very tedious. If you, uh, you, you need to try and, I found anyway, you need to try and keep a normal life and, and, and keep doing the things you love to keep your keep your mind stable. Absolutely. Do you, when you were first brought onto the panel by Liam O'Neill, well, there was, you did an interview where he talked about him handing you a tape uh, called Bigger, Faster, Stronger, because you you probably started out probably a very slim guy. Yeah, uh, I was six five a little bit over 6'5 and about 13 stone. And uh, I was a basketball player. So when I arrived on the scene first, I think everybody was queuing up to hit me. 
but it, that didn't that didn't bother me, Shane. It, it, it didn't, you know, I didn't. Uh, I, I was wiry, I suppose. Um, I didn't. I wasn't getting hurt. I was very, very lucky. Up to about twenty nine thirty, that I had no issues with injuries. And again, I think that was because of the type of basketball training I, I did. Plus, I was very, for a big man, I was very elusive. I, I, I found it that guys were trying to hit me, but they couldn't hit me because of the basketball. Again, I was, I was able to see hits coming early, and I, I, I developed a kind of a mentality that if there was any hitting going to be done, it'd be done on my terms. And when you're when you're my height, and when you're playing two sports, you know I said it to Liam O'Neill. I was very appreciative of the tape, and I worked as hard as I could. But when you're playing two sports and you're training some days twice a day, you're not going to put on major weight. So I was light up to 25, 26 maybe. Um, I was reading um, a couple of quotes taken from Hanging from the Rafters, which Kieran Shannon wrote about basketball in Ireland, and. One of the quotes from it, I'm not sure who exactly said it, was that your first love was basketball, but possibly Gaelic football held you back from fully realising your potential with that. Now, obviously, you love Gaelic football too, but is there anything in that that do you ever consider how far you could have gone in basketball? No, no. I was offered scholarships, Division One scholarships. Uh, one coach from Drexel University, a guy called Eddie Burke, the man is deceased now, he came, he came to Ballina and and hung around me for a week and you know he was very very keen on, on getting me to go there he just needed the type of player I guess that I was um no no I I I I came into Gaelic football not really knowing what to expect we we you know won a Connacht title then we got to an All-Ireland final in 89 I had joined the panel at 86 and that kind of blew my mind away so as a young fellow then 22 23 years of age and I was saying you know, this is a fairly good team. I, I wasn't thinking how old Willie Joe and TJ and Peter Ford and, and the boys were. All I was thinking, this is a good team. We'll get back here again and we'll win in All-Ireland. And that took over an awful lot of my, uh, an awful lot of my time and energy after that. The, uh, I, I played three or four years under 21. I was on the panel uh, for, for two and a half years at that stage. But getting to the All-Ireland final really pushed me over the edge and said, you know, I can do both, you know what I mean? I can play basketball at a high level in the winter time, and I, I hope managers will allow me to play football in the summertime. And winning those national titles with Ballina, especially your home club, did that kind of satisfy your appetite for success in the basketball arena? I did. The, the, the levels were so high at the time, Shane. You know, we, we were, there was two Division I top-class Americans on each team. And because they were so good, uh, it only was a matter of time before the level of the Irish players got good. So I always would say that the level that we were playing at was like division high, division two, collegiate basketball in the States. It was that level. And um, guys were getting £450 a week, uh, Americans at the time. You know, that's 30 years ago. Like that's $900 at the time. So they were getting, we were able to get, bring in big Americans because the crowds were so big. There was, there was plenty of money. There was big sponsorships at the time, Bergelam, Neptune, just, and Britvic from Cork, just to name two. So it was really, that, that eight or nine years that we were up there competing with those teams was like a whirlwind. It was just like a, we couldn't believe with the pool of players that we had, with the facilities that we had, and with the financial backing that we had, we couldn't believe that we were up there with them. And then to win our first national title and to follow that up with a league and, a, and, a, and another cup was... It's something that we're so proud of. I, I, I was inducted into the Hall of Fame there last uh, May. May it was. And more, there was four other people there and they were there with like six people, their family. I had 47 people with me. And uh, like I was ringing, I was ringing every two weeks, every two days, Shane, looking for more tickets. I could have had 150 people. That's how much it meant to us and how proud we were of, of, of that group and and, and, and the way the way that we could compete at that level with teams that had, like we bet Neptune, Bergola and Neptune in the 91 Cup Final down in their own gym. They had their own gym. No, we were in a community centre in Kalala. They had, as far as I know, they had 12 on the roster, two, two Americans and eight Irish internationals. You know, so you can go into their arena and beat them by 18 points. It's just, and have two, two of your brothers on the team and two brother, two future brother-in-laws on the team. It, it's uh, I get goosebumps even thinking about it now. You know that that was 
a long, long time ago. Can you paint a picture of what it would have been like um, playing a, a home game uh, in Ballina? Like, what are we talking about? Tight venue, absolutely packed to the rafters. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, we went we went two seasons, I think, without getting beaten in Kalala. So, you know, it was a really noisy, loud, intimidating place. And the best teams in the country came there and they just couldn't win. The referees were intimidated. The Americans didn't know what to expect. New Americans came in and said, what is this? And um, there was drums beating, two different rims. The rims were two different rims, which you'd never hear of now. So it was just it was just a it was just a place that we were, you know, if you had fourteen home games, we were going to win ten or eleven of them, which automatically propels you into a playoff position. And then as we grew, we were able to go away from home and win win the away games that we were supposed to win. Do you, did you ever like do you did you look over at the American players in the NBA at, at times and think there's some guys here that are good enough to compete with you know, these world superstars? Well, uh, there was definitely, you know, Mario Eli played for Colester. He went back and won three rings, one, uh, two with Houston and one with San Antonio. We played against him four or five times. Good player. I played against better. I thought Diora was, our Diora Marsh was definitely NBA caliber. Um, Ray Smith, Mike Smith. Um, there was so Mike Hancock from Georgetown. They were all coming from big colleges, Shane. They were all top class players. I'd say they were just on the fringes just not making the cut. And the, there was decent money to be had here. And they obviously were looking at, you know, you play 30 games, you get $900 a week, you come over here for six months, improve your game, and I'll have, an, 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 I'll have another shot at the NBA camp next summer. And that's the way it worked out for a lot of them. We, we had a guy called Chris Burke from Philadelphia, a six foot 10 inch guy. He didn't fit into what we wanted. We sent him home and the Sixers picked him up, the, the, the Philadelphia 76ers. And he had three or four 10-day contracts. So he wasn't good enough. He didn't fit into our plans, but he, he was good enough to play for the Sixers. So go figure. It's incredible. And like, yeah. how, how much did you watch the, the NBA during those 90s? Or were you just happy enough playing your own sport and sticking to Gaelic football? Well, no, I modeled my game around Larry Bird and Kevin McHale. I watched the Celtics as much as I could. We were watching those... Uh, those Betamix, Betamix tapes and stuff like that, you get an odd game on, on Channel 4. So if you couldn't get the game yourself, you get one of your buddies to, to tape it for you. And I, I just, you'd stop, rewind, how do you do that? And then you go out on the court then and, 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 um, and, and, and work on it. So whilst, you know, it's saturated with, with soccer now and rugby and NBA basketball, you can get it on whatever channel you want. But in, in our time, you might get to see maybe six, eight games a year but you would keep those games, especially if, obviously if you got them taped, you would keep them, Shane. And you, would, I would anyway refer back to them and have a look at the players that I needed to look at. I never modeled my game around Michael Jordan because I could never be that type of player. He was just so athletic, or Dominic Wilkins. But the likes of Bird and McHale and players like that, you could watch and pick up things for them, and then try and practice it on the on the playground. Is there, I presume you watched the the Last Dance. Is, what what would your takeaway be from that? Is did you come away from it liking Jordan, disliking him? I didn't like him at the start. Fifty percent, sixty percent of that uh, I would have I would have seen um, live over the years. You know, you would have got would have got a lot of those playoff games and stuff. I didn't like him at the start. I I, I thought he was uh, he I, I didn't for one minute think he was going to be as good as he was. He really struggled at the start to become that team player, and Phil Jackson had to convince him that he's not going to win this on his own. And um, I have to say that I massive as the years went on, I. You know, he is the best player. He's probably the best athlete of all time. That's arguable about with, with Muhammad and people like that. But um, I would say that he's the best athlete of all time. But what I loved about him was just his, his, his desire, his desire to win, his will to win, and his, his mental and physical toughness. You know, all these great players, Messi, Roy King, um, Jordan, Shaq, you know, Muhammad, they're all mentally and physically reckless. They're so tough. That's, that's, that's what I admire about him. You know, he was just, I, I, there was a part of the, it was part of, I think it was show six or seven where he was doing all the endorsements. It might have been earlier than that. And he was making all this money and he was busy every day to, doing photo shoots and stuff. And then he said, I go back to my hotel and then I start obsessing about, am I going to win a championship this year? And so that told me I'm making millions, but that doesn't matter. All I want to do is win another championship. So. I, I, if you don't admire a guy like that, I don't know 
And the fact that he was tough on his teammates, that, like, you know, obviously I'd know Steve Kerr. Steve, play, Steve played with him. Uh, it, you know, if you, want to, if you want to win and want to be successful, and at that level, you'd imagine everybody does. Aren't you better off playing with the likes of Mark, Michael Jordan and playing in the playoffs every year than playing with a, the worst team in the league? So, like, a guy like that will demand that you improve and, and, and play at a higher level, and I think that's great. I think the world basically fell in love with Steve Kerr. People who didn't know about him before that and, and everything he's done with the Golden State Warriors since he retired. But how did you get to know him? Um, Steve Kerr went to Arizona co collegiately. Two guys from Arizona that would be two or three years younger than him, Kevin, Kevin Flanagan and Joe McLean, played with us here. So that's where the connection developed and... You know, we, um, Anthony, my brother, went to, the, went to uh, Kevin Flanagan's wedding in San Diego in 97. Now, I seriously considered not play, bringing John Mon and saying, I can't make this All-Ireland final against, against Curry in 97. I have to go to a, wed a wedding because all the NBA players were going to be there. But uh, I, didn't, I, didn't have the, I didn't have the courage to say that to John. So the wedding coincided or collided with... with, with uh, Kevin Flanagan's wedding and all the, all the Kerr was there, all the Arizona boys were there. My brother said it was a, it was a hell of a five day. So they, the connection was there, you know, sport, everybody knows about everybody. And he kept saying, Steve Kerr kept saying, you got to get these guys over to a practice. So two years ago, we went to see the Warriors practice when they were um, world champions. And uh, we, we obviously we were guests of, of Steve himself. And, you know, that was the first time we met him. And, you know, but like we, we would have been, in touch through the boys and in, in, in texts and WhatsApp and stuff over the years. So obviously it was great to see the world champions practice. Kerr was was a complete gentleman. Uh, it was nice to see Durant and Curry and Clay Thompson do their thing. So it was a great experience, very very much enjoyable. Because you you got to watch them warm up for a while, didn't you? And it sounds like they were incredibly impressive. Yeah, we got there early. Uh, Steve told us to the three boys, Durant. Uh, Curry and, and um, Thompson were coming early to do a bit of work, as the great players do. So they were arriving in at like quarter past 10 for 11 o'clock. So we got there early and watched them do their thing before the official practice started, you know. So it was, it was uh, they're like, they're three of the best shooters, I'd say, that ever, that ever lived, Shane. So it was nice to see them, to see them uh, shoot around because, I, believe me, it was very impressive. Do you um have you had as much involvement in basketball coaching as you have in in getting football coaching? Because just over the years, you were a selector with the Mayo team, twenty ones. You were with Clare. You were at St Bridget's, uh, Ross Common at Lowen now, and I'm probably even missing out on a couple. So would you have stayed as involved in basketball? Up to about forty eight, forty nine, I was player coach of our senior team. Uh, that disbanded then. And we just, everybody was away, Shane, you know what I mean? We were like 12 guys on the roster, eight of them would be in college, just couldn't sustain it. We'd have, eight, we'd have 10 players on a, a, a available on a Wednesday. On a Saturday, we'd have only six. So we, we had to bite the bullet and, and pull the plug on that. So we have no senior team now in the town, unfortunately. I don't see how we can ever, the way things have changed with kids going to college and stuff, I don't see how we can ever have a, a successful senior team again, which is very, very sad for me to say, but we have an underage structure that my, my brother and his wife run up to under 16. And every time I'm available, I would be, I, I would be down working with those guys. But like what we're really doing now is just, it's a, it's a kind of an academy and they go off playing with NUIG or DCU or a lot of kids are just playing basketball now to be better Gaelic footballers are better rugby players in this part in this part of the world, you know, in Mayo. So, um, if we had a senior team, I'd still be involved, I would imagine. But at the moment, we don't, and I do a little bit of underage coaching with with, with my brother and the and the uh, and the underage uh, club. How how much of an influence is basketball having in Gaelic football now? Because when I said to you a little just before we um, did the interview about Dublin footballers and the way they seem to set screens, so the likes of. Dean Rock can come around on the on the on the turn and just knock a point over the bar without being tackled. But you kind of said to me that this has been in the game for a long, long time. Yeah. Well, we were doing it. We were doing it in ninety six, ninety seven, with John Mahan, and um, like we would have continued on that. Just it's very difficult to, to to do when the game is live. But from sideline balls and 
and, and freeze from outside scoring range, it's 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 quite easy to do when, when you have a set thing that you can get you can get a guy to run, set a screen for one of your top shooters to get him open, as you said, Dean Rock. He gets that split second, he turns and kicks the ball over the bar, and there's two guys or his marker is looking at the referee, I'm after getting checked there. And you don't have to make contact, Shane. You just have to make check his run. If he has to step left or right, Dean Rock's defender. Now you should be with a good passer of the ball and Dublin of all good passers with a good passer of the ball. You should be getting the ball. The likes of Dean Rock, all he needs is a meter, and then it's over the bar. So, a lot of that, a lot of that stuff is, is going in. The spacing is very evident now. You know they're trying to create this ball movement. You know the more passes you have, same in hurling. The more passes you have, the chances are the more scoring, good scoring opportunities you have. You don't want the ball to stick. You don't want fellas holding on the ball. You don't want fellas going over and back. You want it moving all the time. The more the more kick passing you can do into the full forward line and putting the full back line under pressure, obviously the better. So you see the Dublin guys now hugging the sidelines, trying to open up the middle, trying to get the defenders, the wing backs and the help defenders to make a decision. Are you going to leave me open and clog the middle or are you going to come out to me? Then they kick the ball out to them. The Dublin, the Dublin guy wing forward attacks. Then he pulls the defender. Then they're looking to straighten the line and bring their midfielders like to Fenton down the middle. So... All that, all that is, has come into the game. And then the defensive side of things, see the man, see the ball, good defensive stance, don't cross your leg, concentrate on his torso because that's the last thing to move and, and then help him recover. Be able to help your man and recover. All, yeah. that, is, all that has come into it in the last, uh, and, uh, last 10 years. And it's great because when I was playing, there was no coaching going on. We, we got fish, you picked the 15 and away we went. It only, like in the mid-90s, it started to get, become a little bit more sophisticated. So the more the game grows like that, the better. I would, I would like to see um, teams like pressing the kick out and, and having more of a call, especially against the bigger teams. I know that's easy for me to say, but going out, uh, for me, going out against Dublin or Mayo or Curry or Tyrone and losing by 10 points, it's the same as losing by four or five in a low-scoring game. I think if you go out and have a cut and score... 212 or 214 on them. I think you can take that away and say, look at lads, if we improve on this, if we improve on that, if we get a little bit more physical, if we get a little bit more stronger, we can bridge the gap. I think going out and bring, putting everybody behind the ball and trying to keep the, low, the score low is never going to get you to, to a position. If you have ambition, it's never going to get you to a position where you can maybe win a provincial title or compete with the big boys. Because remember, if you want to win a Super 8 game in, in, in either game, you're going to have to go out and score 18, 19, 20 points. And you'll never do that unless you have balance and shape in your in, in your attack. It's only a couple of years since you were involved with the Ross Common team that won a Connacht title, and you know had a tough time of it in the Super Eights at times. Um, the Dublin game, especially, comes to mind. Maybe the Tyrone one also. How far away or like how tough is it for a team that's maybe we we'll say middle ranked to try and put it up to the top teams such as Dublin? Um, it's it's it, like, the biggest difference you now. Dublin are possibly the best team of all time. Everybody, most people say what they have achieved is unbelievable. But the biggest difference for me and the Roscommon lads was that power and pace. That it, like, I know we didn't, we didn't achieve it, but if you stay with them, and we've seen it so many times with Cork Fisher and Cork, a very good team, or Cork last year, you stay with them till about, if you're only three or four down with 10, 15 minutes ago, and next thing, bang, they scored 3-2 and the game is busted. And they've done that to so many teams, and they're, never, like, they're bringing on top-class players, they're bringing on all-stars, w- w- multiple All-Ireland medals, and that 21-22 core group that Jim Galvin had to, at his disposal were more powerful and more skillful and more aggressive than, than what we ever could put out with, with, with Ross Common. But we, we tried to be true to our beliefs. We tried to go out and score. And two years ago, they beat, us, they beat us very well. We scored 2-9 in the second half. We scored 2-17 in total. We were the only team the whole year to put up that score against them. And we were, like, if you got more time now, you might need seven or eight years to bridge the gap. But that would be my belief, that if you can go out and score that and you can fix and be a little bit more aggressive and find real tough teeth defenders that can do a little bit of one-on-one defending at times. Not all the time. You can't do it all the time. But, like, when you have to do it five or six times again, that you can stand the Dean Rocks up and the, the Mannions and, and, and the O'Callaghan's. You can stand them up. Um, for three or four seconds so the help comes so it's um, from, to answer your question Jane, it was the power and, and the relentless um, wave and the top class players 
coming on with 20 minutes to go that just blows the, the teams that are below the top four or five out of the water. You, you talked about um, some great days with Mayo and, and winning Connacht titles and, and what have you. When you went to, let's say, St. Bridget's and won the Club All-Ireland yourself and Kevin McStay and then obviously doing the same with Ross Common, like, do you get as much joy out of that doing it from teams that, you know, it's not, it's not your native colours? Oh, you do. I get very, again, I'm a very sociable person. I get to know everybody. You know, I would, with, with Bridget's, I'd say I stayed over maybe six nights in that 12 or 13 month period. And you get to know people, you get to know the sacrifice they're making. Fellas in college, fellas, you know, going through all sorts of emotions, as you well know. And then, you know, um, I have to say, we won that All-Ireland. Um, it was, I was absolutely over the moon for them because they'd lost the semi-finals. And they'd lost a final. And believe me, I know how that feels. And it would have been a shame because they were a really, really good team. They just needed a, little, a few little adjustments. And they needed to uh, uh, grow their confidence a little bit. And we felt that we had a great chance. Like people at that time said that we wouldn't keep the ball kicked out to Ballymore, that we weren't near athletic enough. And we knew that. Ballymore were way more athletic. But we also knew that we were a very, very good football team, that we could really stretch the defence with our kick passing, that we could really put them under pressure and make them expend en energy. And that's what we did. And then the likes of Sennon and Frankie and Ian and Carl and Garrett and, 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 and um, Garvin, they all, all the big players played. And that's what needs to happen on that day. When all your big players play, you know, great things can happen like that. I remember thinking you were going to get annihilated after that fast start, Belly. Yeah, yeah. that. that was an awful start, like against a team like them. That's, but see, we, you see, we were scoring. We did an awful lot of work on scoring goals, and you know, like we felt that if we get six chances, we'd score four of them, and we did hours and hours on that. And if a fella kicked the ball off the goalie's arse, he would be killed. Get your head up, look to the far post, find that open man that's filling the lane on the weak side. All that we did that over and over again. So. The bizarre thing was, even though we're eight points down against that caliber of a team, I knew we'd get a couple of goals. And if we knew that, the players knew that as well. So there was never seemed to be any panic that we, if we get a couple of goal chances, we'll get them, we'll, we'll score them, our decision making will be good, and we'll get back at the game. And then you're only four points down at half time. It's anybody's game then at that stage. Well, is it odd coming up against Mayo when you're part of the Ross Common setup? That is strange, uh, and, and, and then like when you're when you're underdog as well, and you're playing against possibly the second best team in the country at the time. It's you know you're getting you're, the crowd are getting on to you, and you know you're you know we 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 had like we had the drawn game in in the quarterfinals, which was which was a great day out for Ross Common. We had the ball at the end of the game. We could have won that game, but we have taken a few bad beatings off Mio as well. And when you're when, when that happens, then myself and Kevin just put the head down and try and slink off and. You know, without getting get, without getting too much abuse, but it is it is it's very difficult getting, going against your own. Um, I've never experienced it with the club, but I've, obviously if I, I've, I've ex experienced it with my own. It's it's not nice, no. It's, it's very, very difficult. Do you, do you still? I mean, a few times you said in the past that you'd like to get the job someday, and of course Kevin was passed over in uh, the time that Noel uh, that Noel and Pat got the job. Is it still something you'd like to do eventually? You're currently with Athlone. I don't think so. I don't think so. No. Um, uh, I felt, I really genuinely felt that if we got that team in 2015, was it, that we would have won an All-Ireland with them, but uh, uh, it was very, very disappointing. More so for Kevin than me, but it, it became a, a dirty sort of a, an experience. You know, there was a, a lot of backstabbing and lying going on. And, you know, um, when you're trying to be honourable and honest about it, 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 uh, it, it wasn't easy. And, and uh Kevin took it very badly, and obviously, uh, obviously, I didn't find it easy either. But it was Kevin that put himself out there as as uh, as manager, and it was you know the genuine great Mayo supporters and the genuine people that are involved with the running of the county had nothing to do with this. We all know we all know who who, who was who was involved, and um, you know uh, the the, the intercounty thing, Shane is. is is very difficult. You're, you're, you, you know, and you'd wonder sometimes, uh, like, why, why do you bother? You know, because uh, even with Ross Common now, and I enjoy getting to know the boys and 
that 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 kind of final win against Galway was amazing. You know, winning winning uh, or getting promoted twice, we had great days. Like I think, if you really put the effort in, no matter what level you are, and you're true to yourself, you will have good days. And we had great days, but it's still hard. And the club football is just, it still is. Thank God, it still is a breath of fresh air that you're dealing with guys that just want to get better, that just want to uh, play football, and and then depend on what level you're at. They're trying to win a county title as well, whether it's Division Five or Division One. Do you see? Um, do you see this Mayo team being able to end the famine anytime soon? I don't know. They 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 look an awful lot like us now in 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 ninety seven ninety eight. Um, people say, and I know they have to say that losing these All Irelands doesn't take anything out of you, but of course it does. You know when you're when I lost, as I, we alluded to it earlier, Shane. When I lost. The All Ireland final in '89, not that big of a deal. I thought we'd been seven or eight All Irelands in a row. That's the way young fellas think. But when you're 29 or 30, like most of these guys are now, and you've lost four, is it four? I think, and a drawn game. That the, you know the energy levels and the enthusiasm will wane, and that's what concerns me now. There's an awful lot of really good players and um, warriors in that group that are getting very close to the end and. Can you can you can can you replace them? Not instantly. You're not going to do it straight away. It's going to take time to develop the type of player uh, that has won three or four All Stars and has played well and played really well in All Ireland finals and maybe could have or should have won an All Ireland. All Ireland. So I, I I don't know. I hope I'm wrong, but I think it's going to take time to rebuild. I think the first thing we all have to do now is win a kind of title. I know there might be a Connacht title this year. You need to win a Connacht title and get that put to bed and then take it from there in the Super 8. I was very conscious not to bring up like the, the same old thing which you're always brought up. and So I don't actually want to talk about Brawl at all. But just there was one comment about 96 that you did say that I found interesting, which was, uh, it was a disaster for me in particular because my team happened to lose. But I don't think it was too bad for Colm Coyle because he collected his all Ireland medal. Do you, do, you, do you fully believe that, that he would have come away from it just still delighted he won his all Ireland medal? Because you would have thought on the biggest day of all, the, for him to win the all Ireland medal, that he'd actually it would be quite tainted to him because he didn't get to play the part he wanted to play. Um, no, I, 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 what I was saying there is he was in a much better position than I, than I was in the minute that final whistle blew. And he was in a much better position than all the Mio footballers that played, that competed in that game or that were involved that day. So I like, I think at that stage he was sent off like nine times or something in league and championship. So <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't uh, anything new for him. I think the be-all and end-all, the way those two games panned out, all that mattered was winning. It was like ruthless. It was nasty. It was a lot of verbal nastiness, a lot of serious hitting off the ball. So, like, you know, you, 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 you're playing highly competitive games that mean so much and you, you enjoy them. There was no enjoyment in those two games. Like, you get your jaw broken like that. So that was the type of games they were. So you had to be you were really on edge and really tried to be alert. You just couldn't run down the field uh, without keeping an eye on yourself. You know that kind of way, and that was the, that that that's the way it was. So they were they were tough encounters. Yeah, absolutely. Like when did you see Richie Hogan getting sent off in the All Ireland last year for Kilkenny? Would yeah. Yeah, would it, would something resonate with you when you see that happen? Yeah, I was very disappointed for him, but he should have been sent off. Like it was the right call by the referee. I know Richie was like a bull after it, but and the Kenny supporters were. But I thought it was the right call. I don't know what happened. Such an experienced player, he seemed to slip a little bit, but it was reckless. And of course, my heart goes out to him when that happens. But you see, whether it happens in the first twenty minutes or the last ten minutes, if it's a red card, it's a red card, and some people kind of. Don't understand that sometimes. I was early in the game and I'm away with it. He's made a mistake. He should be punished for it. And that's, that's where um, sometimes I get a little bit annoyed. You know, a fella get away with something. You can stand on a fella's head in ten, with, with 10 minutes gone. But you can't do You can't pull a fella's jersey then at the end of the game. So I thought he, I thought he deserved to be sent out. But I felt very, very sorry for him. Do, do you reflect on your career? Probably the last thing I'll ask you. Do you reflect on your career and think... All in all, I had a great innings, or do you think of the, the disappointments? Um, I know, no, I don't. I, like, losing All Ireland will never go away from you. 
you, you you never you never be um you you never be happy about that and you, you you could be sitting in a bar or sitting with your mates or even lying in bed reading a book and just oh you know that that point that we missed or that goal we missed to win that all Ireland final because some of them were that close but um uh, I I feel that I trained as hard as I possibly could I sacrificed as much as possible. And I presented myself for all these big games. Now, I was a bit loose when it came to league and stuff like that. But when it came to the big games, I always felt that I was ready. And I think my record would suggest that, that you know, I, I've got man of the match and I think five out of the seven kind of titles and only my own man to get man of the match in an all Ireland final since 1951. So my conscience is clear. When you lose games, and you know this yourself as a, as a gay man yourself, when you lose games, there's always regrets and there's always little mistakes you made. But if you've given it everything, you put your body on the line and did everything you possibly could to win those games. I, I, I've learned that as the years went on. What have you got to be um, uh, ashamed of? Or, or what, what, do you've got, what have you got to have sleepless nights over? And on top of that, then the basketball has helped me to understand that I wasn't a loser, that I, that, that I, that I, I was a winner because I was able to uh, lead my basketball team to uh, success when the game was at its highest. So my conscience would be clear, and I, I always felt that I trained diligently, gave it everything I had, and in the big games, a lot of the times I played well. Thanks very much, Liam. Really appreciate your time.